Hey everybody, I'm back with my friend Jam, an interventional radiology NP and new grad who has all the tips. We're going to be talking about all things procedures. This is a video I've been wanting to do for quite some time because there are some little things that I think can really change your competence and your skill level when you're doing procedures. This isn't going to be a heavy in-depth discussion about every single procedure, but just generalized advice when you're doing procedures, particularly when you're working inpatient. All right. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm an RNNP mentor, interview strategist, and content creator. Welcome to the channel. Okay. So in interventional radiology, you basically are putting anything into the body with a needle, a wire, or a catheter. And by catheter, it can go up to things as large as a chest tube. True. Yeah. Um, and you're using devices. You're using imaging, whether it's ultrasound or x-rays with fluorosities. Mm -hmm. Or is that mostly just the positions we're using the fluoroscopy? No, we do, we do a lot well. on the fluoro. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, a lot of our, probably more of our, I'd say it's about 50-50. We do um, about half with fluoroscopy, half with ultrasound mm -hmm. of our procedures. The bigger ones uh, are really more with fluoroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do a lot with, uh, with CT. Um, okay. Our docs do the majority of CT. I, I'm starting to get into doing a little bit of chest tubes with CT, mm -hmm. but uh, it's it's a work in progress. Yeah, I would imagine that's really kind of challenging. Um, I've never really, I, I will use CTs to guide, like if I'm putting a chest tube in in particular, like I will look at this CT before I am like, okay, I think I have a bigger collection over here and I'm going to use my sonocyte and look there, but not like in real time. So I feel like in some ways it would be, there's a little bit of muscle memory here, I think, like getting used to using ultrasound to do something because as a nurse, we're used to feeling for a vein, you know, getting to pop up feet, you going off a of feel. And when you're doing things in this role, it's more on what you're seeing and either it's um, like landmarks or you're looking with something. It's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've obviously, I've done procedures without, with just, you know, an ultrasound probe and not a, a you know, not a, having CT or fluoro mm -hmm. or something like that. And, uh, it's nice. Yeah, it is, it is nice. Um, it's like cheating. It, it almost, it, yeah, it's kind of, it's like, kind oh, of cheating. Right there. <laughs> yeah. it, I, sometimes it can actually confuse you a little bit. You, know, yes. you have to really, it takes some time to learn to orient to what you're seeing, you know, and, and mm -hmm. like the orientation of, if you know, when you're on a fluoro table, you change where that arm is anywhere and you're changing that. The perspective. Yeah. So, yeah. I would right. have a very hard time. With, I have a hard time with that spatial eye awareness thing. Like I would so, find it challenging. You know, and then you're doing a similar procedure, but now you're doing it with ultrasound, right? So you have mm -hmm. to, you've kind of got to learn all those different modalities and how, how the anatomy, everything changes when you change views, when you mm -hmm. change, you know, just the, the small angle of, mm -hmm. of where of uh, where your imaging is coming from. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the first hurdles when I started doing procedures as an NP was getting used to looking at a screen to guide me doing something. And I still like uh, when I intubate, I do not prefer to use the glidoscope, which is what most people like to use because you get such a crisp, beautiful image of the airways with it. But it is very, you're not looking in the airway, you're looking up at a screen. And I, for some reason, my brain, I don't know what it is, I, there, I just cannot get used to looking here and not here. So I find it a little bit more challenging, you know? Um, and so when I first use ultrasound, which we use ultrasound, particularly in critical care for like everything, you look at the heart, you look at the belly, <laughs> you look at the vessels, you look at everything. And when you're doing procedures, you're using it. You look at the lungs, you look at everything. And so, I wish that I had gotten some training on how to use the ultrasound itself before I ever put a needle into anyone. And I didn't get that. There was, I didn't get anything like that in school. Um, when I started working, it was just, this is just what we use. And over time, I've gotten more skills with it. But my advice to people is always spend some time, even if you can't go to a conference, even if you can't go to a skills lab, just watch a bunch of videos. Watch a bunch of videos teaching you how to use the exact machine that you have at your facility. Because if you can know how to orient yourself with your probe, what probe to use, how to orient it, what you're looking at, what modes. You know, for years, I didn't even use Doppler or color mode. And what a wonderful resource those are if you're not sure what vessel you're in. They're fabulous, but you've got to know that they're there and use them to help you identify what you're seeing. Um, so I, that's my biggest piece of advice is learn how to use your tools before you do the procedures. I think, uh, like you said, I, I personally sought a little uh, experience with ultrasound before I ever became an MP, so mm -hmm. that helped me a lot. Uh, it also made me fairly marketable. Mm -hmm. um, 
because they knew that I was I had a, a higher degree of trainability. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can it can help you get a job too. But uh, in terms of doing procedures, if uh, you can seek out, I think a, a core. I, I personally still intend to do it, um, even though I use them all the time mm -hmm. to. Uh, to take a course or, mm -hmm. you know, a skills lab on um, yeah. ultrasound. Yeah. Ultrasound is such a versatile tool for pretty much anything you want to do in the hospital. Most of the procedures that I do involve the Seldinger technique. Is that what you utilize? Uh, yes. So for almost every. That's a wire through a catheter. Needle, mm -hmm. catheter, needle, wire, catheter. I mean, yeah. Where it gets tricky, um, and you know, being in this three months now, I'm still trying to figure it out is uh, a lot of times in the past when I, you know, when I was in school um, and doing procedures, you use what's in the kit. Yeah. Right? Now you're in, you're in the lab, you're in the IR lab and you have all these things at your disposal and you've kind of got to start figuring out what's the best tool for this job. Mm -hmm. Or if you run into a complication, it's do I, you know, am I, do I want a stiffer wire? Do I want one that's hydrophilic or not? Mm -hmm. You know, um, what length wire do I really want for this? Mm -hmm. So it's there's not just a way one size fits more, all. Way You've more. You've got to start thinking. Yeah, you know, do mm -hmm. you, you use like you might use a you get in a gym, you might use a directional catheter. You know, so you put a catheter over that wire that you can now direct that wire into where you want it to go. Um, so those things. Uh, that takes some getting used to. Yeah, I can imagine. I would be, if I didn't have it all laid out. I mean, I know what's in my kit, and I also know what's yeah. in, like, the cart outside my room. But outside of that, I got no when clue. You, when you don't no have clue. other options. You don't know what else you, is. You know where to go next. You know, because right. The more options there are, the more it, it takes a little bit of uh -huh, uh, thinking uh -huh. through it. You know? Yeah, it's like a mini OR, you know. It's a mentally invasive yeah, OR. Yeah, it really is. Just like you said. So, who taught you how to do all these procedures? Um... Most of the, what I've done so far, uh, it, I've learned from the other APPs. Mm -hmm. uh, now, luckily, uh, and I don't, I don't think you're going to find this everywhere, but we have two APPs on our team who have both been doing this for over 20 years. Yeah. Um, and they both have, they, they come from different places. So they both have a little bit different, unique experiences and styles, um, which somewhat made it hard because I'm really learning from four different APPs, two of mm -hmm. which, you know, uh, both have 20 years of hard, I do it this way experience, right. you know, uh, and they're not always the same. So, but you learn different things that each of them do that makes it, uh, yeah. that you kind of form your own at some yep. point. Yeah, you, you know? take away all the little bits of knowledge and you make your own. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the, the doctors too, they'll, throw in a few tips mm -hmm. here and there and they've always got something uh, mm -hmm. you know that those fellowships that they do they, yeah they come out with some pretty interesting tricks so have you had any like light bulb moment because you did a fair number of procedures as a student so you kind of went in with a, a decent amount of experience so were there any like anything that stood out that you were like oh my god I've never thought about that that's brilliant like for example <laughs> One of the APPs that helped train me, I think I did my third central line with her, and she had, didn't have much really to offer because I had already kind of seen it done so many times. She was like, well, if I teach you nothing else, use your hemostats and go underneath the catheter you just inserted to grab the bio patch to pull it through. And I was like, oh my God, I've been struggling for like a month trying to figure out how to feed that thing through that tight little space that you've already sutured down. Like, I've never thought to do that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, probably, I can't even think of the number of times uh, I've learned something new and it's a lot of times it's small things like that like you understand the big concept right mm -hmm. of what what um, what we need to do next in the procedure but it's the little things of stand here versus there right mm -hmm. a little change in positioning makes a difference of um, whether you can you know say for instance right very different when you start doing central line. Like we do a central line, you're almost it's a straight shot. Mm -hmm. When you start tunneling, you're doing tunnel procedures. You're entering that IJ mostly from a lateral position. Okay. Okay. So you wow. And now you that's so you got like and then you can only get kind of the tip of the needle in. Ooh, um, I don't know that I could do that. But then you have to figure out now, especially for me being right-handed, you. It's hard to, you, you don't want to be coming across your body when you're trying to gain yeah. access. So you're kind of looking at the feet and you go, mm -hmm. you're going to enter in, you know, from the lateral aspect like that. But now you've got to come around and somehow get your foot on the fluoro pedal and see it oh. while you're trying to 
put a wire. I've never but now the wire is over here. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> you're like <laughs> Yeah. So it, it takes some Yeah. Uh, you start Finagling. watching people do it and you see the little tips and yeah. tricks they got. Okay. So what's the scariest procedure that you do? Um I'd say right now, um, none of them are overly scary. The one that's a little, so thyroid FNAs are a little mm, scary. I mean, it's a tiny right little neck. needle, yeah. but you're in someone's neck. Yeah. And if they, the people will move and they'll talk and they swallow oh, yeah, and like, you've hey. got this needle sitting. Yeah. So it seems like the most simple procedure because it's soft tissue. Yeah. Right? You're not in a vessel. But there's a bunch of vessels right there. Yeah. There's a trachea right there. And yeah. here you are while they're, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you say, don't move, don't talk, don't swallow. People they're going to do, do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so that can be a little nerve wracking. I can see that. I've never thought about it, but I can see that. I haven't really. So one, I've, I'm, I've got a lot of work in so far. We've got most of my procedures that I've, uh, that I've become fairly competent on. One thing I haven't done much of so far is biliary procedures. Mm -hmm. So I uh, kind of, that's, I don't know if it'll be that difficult once I get into it, but at the moment it just seems new to me. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit scary. You don't yeah. want to be messing anything up in someone's biliary tract, yeah. especially when it's going through their liver. Yeah. You know? I didn't even thought about it. I was just assuming that the physicians did the PC, PTC drains and stuff like that, but they do the drains, mm -hmm. uh, the initial. So they'll do any initial when it, so, um, biliaries, nephrostomies, anything like that. They do the initial stick. We do any checks, changes, anything like that. Gotcha. So okay. if that if that tube needs to be changed out, then we're changing it over a wire. But mm -hmm. you, you know you can get into some hairy situations, and the last thing you want to do is uh, lose that access, mm -hmm. and then your physician has to come and do a new stick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, speaking of complications, that's always my fear too. You hear horror stories about people cannulate the artery instead of the vein or whatnot, and then you have to call a vascular surgeon to come in and save you. Like, oh god. Just makes me, makes me nauseous just thinking about it, but it happens, it happens all the time. How do you feel about perceiving risk? And we talked about this in a little bit of the video that we already did, yeah. talking about your job in specific. But I feel like when you're doing a job that is 100% procedures, you're going to have risks for sure. I mean, how do you, how do you feel as someone new into this? How do you handle and mitigate risk? Well, um, you know, it's kind of difficult. Uh, a lot of the people we see are, you know, as with you, if you're doing procedures on these people, they're pretty ill. Yeah. Uh, so you know there's a lot of issues already. We try to follow guidelines. So, um, you know, one of the biggest risks for us is always bleeding. Yeah. So um, we, we try to follow so, um, coagulation guidelines. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody's on some form of blood thinner. So mm -hmm. you, you've really got to be on top of it. And, double checking the nurses, double, mm -hmm. triple check. You know, you, you want to know what they're taking when the last time they took it was. Yep. Make sure you have updated labs. So a big thing is, is always um, looking at your coags and making mm -hmm. sure that they're not high risk for bleeding, making sure they have a lot of the people that we see are um, cancer patients. Yeah. So the, a lot of them are, they have issues with platelets, you know, they're also immunosuppressed and we're putting implants in their bodies, we're poking Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're poking biliary tracts and gallbladders and stuff and all that stuff puts a, a pretty good risk on it. So you, you do have to weigh some of those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think too, one of the things that I was taught early on is when you're looking at risk, um, control what you can. So for example, if I'm worried about pneumos, which I'm always worried about, if I'm putting anything in the IJ, Put it on the side where you may already have a pneumo. If you've already got a small apical pneumo on the left, put in a chest, put in a central line on the left if you've got to go IJ. I mean, there's already something there, right? Um, so just looking at case by case and patient by patient, being systematic and doing the same things every time and assessing what the bleeding risk is, what the pneumo risk is, whatever the specific thing is that you're doing, what that risk is, but also what's specific to that patient that you can do to reduce that risk um, or to control it. And also knowing my backup, like who's going to be my backup person if I get into trouble here and and what position is going to be available if I need one. Um, all of those kind of things. So you have to learn when to say no to, you know, for sure. We, we for get a, sure. Lot of, uh, a lot of requests for thoracentesis. Yeah. And uh, 
you ultrasound that patient and there's a tiny little yeah it's really not there. worth sticking and the, the person may seem like they're in, and you know they may they may be tachypnic and they may be having a difficult time oxygenating so you think oh they need this but it's not, it, it's, not that, it's not that little 150 yeah. milliliter pocket that's in there and yeah. you're taking a much bigger chance of dropping yep. a lung by poking that needle in there with a tiny little space yep. of fluid than you would be to just wait until you know check them tomorrow and see yeah. if they've accumulated some more and if so then we can do it then yeah i agree i mean it's to me assessing risk is not a checkbook it's not a black and white it's a scale some people have less risk some people have significant more risk in assessing that and then just having an honest conversation with them like hey i can do this but here's the chances of what could go wrong and letting the patient kind of help guide their care if they're able to um, it's just, there's so many nuances to it. Um, and I think as NPs, we get pulled a lot of times into the whole, someone wants us to do something, whether it's a primary team or whether it's a bedside nurse and they ask and they ask and they ask, not really knowing what the risk is that they're asking you to assume. So you, as Jim said, you have to be willing to say, at this time, I do not think that the benefits outweigh the risks here. And that just takes time, honestly, because it is so highly specified to your patients. <laughs> Yeah. So what tools do you use to help you do your job? It's pretty great though. Yeah. And sometimes you don't, like I'm always learning new things. So for instance, um, every, now you do a bedside LP, half the time you've got somebody bent over or curled up, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you're just, you, you're just guiding based on, you're going under that, that, uh, you know, that vertebra and trying to slide it up in. Yeah you get under fluoro and we do them supine or actually no, i'm sorry not supine but prone, prone. right mm -hmm. so they're prone and you can just look right down on yeah. their inner line or space like that yeah now sometimes that's you can so now you can see the space but what you can't tell from that is depth mm. so sometimes you get in that way and then you have to turn them z cube mm -hmm. and now you can look at them and see you know you're in the right direction and you can see your depth mm, okay. as you're going in interesting you know? yeah. so and that was one of my questions too is positioning how much do you think positioning comes in patient positioning comes into play with success in procedures oh it's a lot right yeah it's a lot huge mm -hmm. huge um the, the the turn of a, a head a half an inch can make all the difference everything. of whether you can get access or mm -hmm. um you know whether what you're trying to biopsy is there or not mm -hmm. you know I think so too. I one of the tips I learned after I'd been doing lines for a little while, this NP that I was working with said, so Well, just move his arm down. So move his arm down. She took so if I was on the right side, she took his right arm and pulled it down like this, and it just opened up this musculature here that that vein was able to pop open. I mean, the view went from like maybe 50% view to a full on 100% view, and I was like, Oh my gosh, I had no clue. <laughs> so that's my other tip to people is learn, do some investigation on what position is best for what procedure that you're doing, because it can make all the difference in the world and making it an easier task for you and, and reducing your risk. Okay, so that's really all I got for a general discussion on procedures. Um, this is again, not meant to talk about any one particular thing, but just to give you overall tips and advice from somebody who's doing it all day, every day, 20 times a day, <laughs> successfully at that. All right, thanks, Jim. You're welcome.